Good morning, Cross and Crown, and welcome to all the guests joining us for today. Glad you're here. Uh, we are taking a break from the book of Romans. We just wrapped up chapter 12, so that was exciting. And for the summer, we're going to do a totally different series. And the series is entitled, God Is. And so we're going to look at four true statements about who God is and how that should affect us. All right, so God is, our brand new series, very excited about that. And for today, I'm going to read for us out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, and uh, just a couple selected passages out of chapter 40. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? To whom then? Will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you how you reveal yourself in it. I pray as we get into this, this brand new series, would you give us hearts that are receptive, minds that are open, uh, ears that are attentive to receive and to hear and to understand. Oh God, I pray that as I teach today, would you open my mouth so I could speak as I ought to, and would you open hearts of everyone listening, no matter where, no matter when. As they listen to this message, I pray it would be used for your glory. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's it's a brand new series. And as we were praying through and thinking through the summer months, and and particularly kind of that that, uh, July time frame, uh, the elders decided that we were going to take a little bit of a break from the book of Romans, and we're going to get back to it, actually. We're not going to do what we've been doing in years past, where uh, we just took some time after Easter, and then once summer hit, we kind of changed the rest of the year. We're going to hopefully finish the book of Romans uh, between August and the beginning of Advent. So that's our hope. But for the summer, we are in a brand new series called God Is. And the, the amazing thing is that I think it will be really, really helpful uh, for us to look at these truths about God uh, during particularly this time. Uh, And I think what we have all in common is uh, we are all experiencing the uncertainty, to some extent the the chaos, the, the fear, the unrest that both the pandemic as well as some of the recent events, particularly uh, in our country and in our city, have brought, right? And so uh, the pandemic is somewhat global, and then in a more local way, we have experienced this unrest, this disunity. Uh, We have seen frustration, and we have seen that like boil over in different ways, and uh, the economy has tanked, and tensions are running high. That's kind of where we find ourselves. And I think there's not really a lot of exception. There's some people maybe that feel better prepared, and yet even for them, uncertainty and kind of what comes with uncertainty generally is fear. And so uncertainty and fear 
are entering into kind of your, at least your subconsciousness. And as things are getting more tense, they have a tendency to boil over. And, and so what do we do in times when uh, things are tense, are uncertain, are chaotic, are causing fear and anxiety within us? We tend to look for sources of relief, right? And, and, and some of us are more like, okay, I'm going to stick my head in the sand and hope this goes away. Or we tend to self-medicate, and that takes different forms, some throw themselves into work. But what if you have lost your job? What if you don't have work? Some uh, throw themselves into various uh, distractions, right? And that can be a hobby, that can be anything. But we're trying to be distracted from having to think about what we're all encountering. Uh, some of us are self-medicating. And even that takes a variety of different ways. I think deep down, we're all looking for sources that can relieve the tension, relieve the pressure, ease the anxiety, and hopefully bring some level of solution for us. Uh, interesting enough, like the advertisers are out in full force trying to get in and cashing in on our dilemma, right, on our fear. So uh, if you're on any of the news channels, it's like, all right, we are going to provide for you recession-proof uh, investments. Uh, is that where you're going? Are you afraid for the economic implications and you need to recession-proof your implications? Well, there's an old actor who is kind of all washed up. He is telling you, buy gold. That's the answer right? Uh, and so maybe that's not your thing. Maybe for you, it's just like, I need to somehow pandemic-proof my business plans. I need to come up with a different business. I need to uh, kind of get out of whatever I'm doing right now because I lost my job or my business was affected. And so how can I pandemic-proof my business plan, my career plans for the future? Uh, maybe uh, you're just thinking, man, I'm really, really concerned about just surviving, my, my health. What if I get this thing? What, what would COVID do to my health? I, I have a compromised immune system. I have some level of higher risk. How do I COVID-proof my health? What's my health plan? Is it gloves? Is it a facial shield? Is it a mask? Is it all of the above? Well, those are realistic fears right now, right? For, for some of us, uh, we're looking to November 3rd, and we're looking to the election. I just talked with my neighbor, and uh, he was very upset about everything going on. And uh, he said, well, at the very least, my hope is that in November, we will have a Democrat back in the White House, and that's going to solve it all. Wow, that's, that's his hope. Right? Now, you might be with that individual, or you might be like, oh, if only we re-elect the Republicans. Well, I've told you this before. Our hope is not in a political party, a political system. It's not what we're hoping for. It's not what we're dreaming about. It's not what ultimately will save us. Right? Uh, some people are looking for religion. And man, if you are out there, and you have joined us, you have clicked in on our link to find out more of, is there a solution in something outside of me, in something beyond what I can control? Because I figured out during this time that I can control precious little. Then, man, we would love to interact with you. We'd love to talk with you. I would love the chance to kind of answer some of your questions and talk with you uh, about the fact that there is a God and that God loves you and that God specifically drew you in to listen to this sermon, to be a part of this service. And that God has entered the world, a uh, sin, sickness, brokenness, shriveled world. He entered to save us. And, and here's what's amazing. I think ultimately, whether it's gold and the, uh, you know, recession-proof investments or whether it's a political party with the elections in November or whatever it is, we are looking for 
a savior. Right? We're looking for someone that's going to come and rescue us. Here's another thing that all of these have in common. They demand that we put our faith, that we put belief in these different solutions that hopefully are going to get us out of the jam that we find ourselves in, right? The, the COVID pandemic, racial disunity, unrest, political chaos jam that we find ourselves in, right? Well, here's the, the question. What is belief? What's belief? It might even be something, if your community groups are meeting online, that might be something to talk about. But what do you think belief actually is? Well, some people say, well, it's a conviction. Or others have suggested, no, it's something that you trust in. It's a, it's a trust. Uh, someone else says, well, actually, your belief is a certainty of something. It's knowing something for sure, just being absolutely sure of it. But see, it's, it's more than just knowing something for sure, right? A true belief would be something that would cause you to live in such a way as it would make evident that this particular truth, this particular thing actually is accurate, is true, is real. So for, for Christians, right, we would say we believe that God loves us, that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, entered the world, lived sinlessly among us, tempted and all, died on the cross, was buried, rose again, returned to heaven, and he is coming back. He's coming back to set up his kingdom, and he's coming back to bring us into his presence forever and ever. Now, that belief is not just intellectual assent. It is not just, okay, I know this for certain. I am sure of this. I have studied all the books. I have read all the texts. No, it is knowledge that will apply itself. If it's true belief, it will apply itself in the way we live, right? It, ultimately, that's how belief works. Now, in Romans uh, chapter 9, when we studied this just not too long ago, uh, Romans 9, verses uh, 9 and 10, it talks about belief, right? It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this is a belief that leads to salvation. Verse 10 then, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. With the heart one believes. Now, biblically, scripturally, it's amazing. This terminology, heart, is used 850 times. And when we look at it, we see that the heart actually is not just this muscle that pumps blood, but that the heart is the mind, it is the will, it is the emotions, it is the decision-making center of your being. It's all those things, right? The, the heart is how we think and make decisions. The heart is what we feel. The heart is ultimately controlling our will, right? The Bible says it is from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So the heart is pretty important, right? And, and because it's pretty important, we read in the book of Proverbs this. Keep your heart. Keep your heart. That's, that's what we just described. Your mind, your will, your emotions Keep it with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. And so that part of us, that innermost part of our mind, our will, our emotions, when that all comes together, that will affect 
everything about us, right? It will shape how we live. Now, as Christians, what should shape us and what should frame for us the way we live is the gospel message, right? It is this truth that Jesus has come to save us. It's this truth that God loves us. It's this truth that God made us to be image bearers, to, to know him, to love him, and to display him to the world. That, that's ultimately what should shape everything we do and everything about us, uh, right? At Cross and Crown, we say, okay, our mission is simple. It is to make disciples, people that know and love and follow Jesus, and then send those disciples into the world. For what purpose? To make more disciples, right? And so we've decided that the strategy we would employ in order to get that done, in order to make sure that people become disciples, that is, become Christians, grow as disciples, that means they grow both in knowledge as well as in application on how they live their lives. The strategy we've chosen is we're going to do services, we're going to do community groups, and we're going to do discipleship uh, groups, right? So that's the strategy. What do we do in those? What's our hope ultimately, for example, for our community groups? Well, the hope is very simple. Uh, the hope was that, or, or the, the purpose of these groups was that they should gather for discipleship to learn and to do, right? To, to learn what the gospel is all about and to live that out in very tangible ways. Uh, discipleship, care. We all have wounds and brokenness and different things that happen in our lives, right? And so we said people need an opportunity to be able to talk about that. People need an opportunity to have others gather around them and pray for them and care for them and encourage them. And if need be, identify that that needs to be brought to a pastor or that that needs to be brought in for, uh, to a counselor for long-term care. So discipleship, care, friendship. I, it's not good for us to live in a state of isolation, right? We can all attest to that. Having friends and being a friend is significant, it is meaningful, and it is beautiful. And Jesus doesn't just save us to live in isolation. Jesus saves us to live in the community of believers with authentic and real friendships. So, let me give you the first three again. Discipleship, care, friendship. And the fourth is mission. Friends who are gripped by the truth of the gospel, saved by Jesus, in love with Jesus, who have found healing and wholeness in the gospel on mission together to declare that Jesus is God, that salvation is found in no one else but him, and that people should come and be washed clean, be freed, and be loved by the Savior, right? That's kind of our purpose for these community groups, our purpose for these discipleship groups. That's why, that's why we do it. Now, here's the hope. The hope for how the gospel should shape everything, right? We, we have this slogan, and some of you hate it, and some of you love it. We put it on a t-shirt, and people got all freaked out by it. Um, Jesus changes everything, Right? The message of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the intervention of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the work of Jesus, it changes everything. But it only changes those things when we come in submission to it, right? And so uh, the big message of Jesus is called the gospel. Good news. What's the gospel? Well, the gospel is that there is a God who loves you, and this God has come to save you, right? The gospel is the good news that God saves sinners. That's the most fundamental, most basic way to phrase it. The gospel is the good news that we are saved by the finished work of Jesus and not by anything that we either have to do or in some way, shape, or form could do. That's the gospel. And so a hope is, man, that 
every person that comes to Cross and Crown and calls Cross and Crown home would know the gospel, would, would know all about it, right? That's why we spend so much time talking about it. That would not just know it intellectually, yes, Jesus died on the cross for my sin, he was buried and he rose again, right? Anyone can recite that. But that we wouldn't just know it, but that we would believe it. That we wouldn't just believe it, that we would live it, right? And that we wouldn't just live it, but that we would declare it. And we would declare it in such a way to others that they could come to faith, but also to ourselves, so we would continue to live it, right? And so here's, here's what our hope is for this series. Our hope is that it would close the gap between what we know and how we live. Some might say, okay, well, what about the belief part? Well, I think there's days when I would say I go through times where I know the truth, I believe the truth, and yet I still fail to live it out. And maybe that's, maybe that's just my experience, and the reality is it's in my belief system where the breakdown happens. Maybe I don't truly believe it, and, and the way I act demonstrates that I don't fully believe it. Okay, so let's phrase it differently. My hope for the series would be that the gap between what I know and how I believe and therefore live, maybe that's better, right? That gap, that that would be shrunk. One author actually said that when that gap, we close it through sanctification. The gap between what we know to be true and how we live, as that happens, that's called sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, all right? So our actions must align with what we know is true about God. Let me say that again. Our actions, how I live, how I behave, how I walk, right, it must align with what I know to be true about God. A.W. Tozer, old theologian, said this. He said, what comes into your mind or what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Well, that's thinking. Wow, okay, that's something to chew on. That's true. What do you think about when you think about God? Do you think... He is kind, or is he vindictive? Do you think he is loving, or do you think he is indifferent? Do you think he is intimately concerned, or he is far off? What comes into your mind? When you think God... What's the picture you get? What's the thought you get? What's the word that pops into your mind almost immediately? Do you think of a loving, good, concerned, involved God? Or is something entirely different popping into your mind? Is, is, do you maybe see this, oh yeah, it's an old guy in the sky who has no idea what's going on and he is hard of hearing to boot, right? Is that, is that what you think? Do you think that he is vindictive and vicious and angry? Do you think he's absent altogether? Do you think he's cruel? What comes into your mind, what you think about, when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Well, we are hoping that actually we are able to help you think more truly, think more rightly, and believe more rightly about who God is. See, 2 Corinthians, let me pull that up. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, actually chapter 5, my apologies, verse 7 says this. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. See, that the Christian 
experience, a Christian life, is often called the walk. There's a bunch of different passages. Ephesians does that. Uh, Paul actually is really fond of that terminology. Walk worthy of the calling by which you've been called. Right? And so here it says, we walk, we, we live the Christian life by faith and not by sight. Now, our faith, our belief, must affect, it must shape every step we take to to stick with the analogy of walking right so how i think my emotions how i behave my actions right my my worries the things i'm stressed out about all of it ultimately must be shaped by faith and when it's not i always get myself in trouble and I, I think probably if you start thinking through different aspects of your life, you will have the same experience. All right? So here, here's a different way of looking at it. All sin, think of your sin. I know that's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable for all of us. All sin ultimately is rooted in believing a lie about who God is. Do you believe the truth about who God is? Or do you believe lies about who God is? See, and then sin, as a consequence of sin, comes destruction and death and bondage. So this series, God Is, is supposed to give you four truths about who God is that will help you live free from sin and live more joyfully than you right now do. Uh, now, John puts it this way, and I, I love this passage. I want to read it for us uh, because I think it aligns with the things I've said so far. In John chapter 8, verse 32, he says this. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We want you to know the truth about God, and we want that truth to bring freedom and ultimately to bring joy. All right, so let me give you the four that we're going to take a look at. Number one, and we're going to give it whatever time I have left at the end of this. We're going to enter into that today. But number one, God is great. Number two, God is gracious. Number three, God is glorious. Number four, God is good. So great, gracious, glorious, and good. Now, it's not just the statement about God. It actually has a subtext or a, well, so what? Let me read you that as well, all right? God is great, so I don't have to be in control. Ugh, I like to be in control. But th there's a burden that comes with being in control, right? You can feel it. You like, you're going frantically through all kinds of things that you're trying to control, even now as you're listening to me. God is great, so I don't have to be in control. Number two, God is gracious, so I don't need to prove myself. Do you struggle with the fear of man? Do you feel like you consistently and constantly have to show that you are worthy? God is gracious to you. He loves you, and you do not need to prove yourself. He accepts you. Your acceptance is based on Jesus and his work. God is glorious, number three. So I don't need to fear others. God is the one to be feared. What others think of me is irrelevant. And number four, God is good, so I don't need to look elsewhere for satisfaction, for goodness, for good things. God is good, all right? So our hope is that these four weeks, we will be able to speak truth into your hearts, speak truth into your minds, so that you would be able to know and to believe truth about God that would bring freedom and that would bring joy for you 
in this time, and not just in this time, but for the rest of your Christian life. All right? So let me get, with the time I have remaining, into the first one. God is great, so I don't have to be in control. What does it mean that God is great? Well, theologically, we could give you a couple of the attributes of God that, that are connected to that. All right? So, for example, we could say God is free. He does whatever he pleases, right? Psalm 115, verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever pleases him. All right, well, that, that's problematic, right? We, we, as human beings, we get nervous, right? Because we know, oh my goodness, if there's someone with ultimate power, that's probably going to go wrong for us. Well, God is free to do whatever he wants. It gets better. God is omnipotent. God is able to do all that he desires, to do all his holy will. It's a Latin word from omni, everything, and potent, meaning the power. He is power of everything. God is sovereign. That's another way to describe this, uh, this idea that God is great, right? God has unrestricted power, unrestricted power over all of creation. You go, I'm not sure I like this. Let me, let me try to help us with this, okay? Because see, he, here is what's amazing. God's attributes are all interrelated, okay? So his power is connected to his love, is connected to his kindness, is connected to his holiness. So he, yes, he is omnipotent. Yes, he is free to accomplish all that he desires to accomplish, but it is connected to and modified by all his other attributes. So we don't have to ever fear that God is going to be capricious, that he is going to uh, just be evil in some way, that he's going to lie. No, see, God's attributes, his attributes of omnipotence, his attribute of freedom, his attribute of sovereignty, right? All that is modified by his love, by his kindness, by his holiness, that's how it works, all right? So all the characteristics of God are intertwined, and he is the one who is great. He is the one in charge of it all. Jesus makes this statement, right, to the disciples. Uh, at one point he says, yeah, with man this is impossible, but nothing is impossible for God. All things a possible for God. All throughout the Old Testament, again and again, throughout the prophets, we read, for God, nothing is impossible. Our God is in the heavens, and he does whatever pleases him. Let me give you a couple more verses on this. In Daniel chapter 4, this is uh, actually a formerly pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, miraculously gets saved, and he gets saved by having uh, himself humbled. You could say humiliated. And, and this is the conclusion he comes to, right? He says this, Blessed be the Most High, and praised and honored, who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? What he's saying here, no one can question God. No one can hold him accountable. This is not necessary anyways because he does what is good and just and right. All right, then we have uh, Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness, what did we say his greatness was? His omnipotence, his sovereignty, his freedom to do as he wills is 
unsearchable. God is fully and entirely in charge. The verse that we started with, or the verses in Isaiah, right? We, we read here that he measured the waters. Th- that's all the oceans, all the springs, all the lakes, everything in the hollow of his hand. He marked the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure. He weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in the balance. It says that he calls out the stars, and he knows them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one of them that isn't supposed to is missing. He is a creator. He made everything from the smallest subatomic particle to the greatest galaxy, right? Like, I mean, I've always been fascinated with the stars and fascinated with the speed of light. Uh, You you guys know the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, right? Which comes to something like 5.88 trillion miles per year, all right? That's crazy. And then we start measuring Things like our galaxy, the Milky Way, right? 200 to 400 billion stars, we aren't totally sure. One galaxy in the last thing I read, and this was like just recently uh, in Forbes magazine, they said they now believe that it's not 200 billion galaxies, but no, there's up to 2 trillion galaxies, all with about 200 to 400. Unbelievable. I I, I can't. It's crazy. Are you still there? You, You with me? It's amazing, right? Our galaxy, our home, 100,000 light years across. 100,000 times 5.88 trillion. I, I, can't, I can't do the math. I can't figure that out. And God's like, yeah, right here. Yeah, right, right, there it is. Our God is great. Not only is he great, he is good. And he is fully in control. Uh, Now, what this should do for us, what this ought to do for you and me, it ought to put us at ease. If the one who loves you is in charge, everything's good. We see it with little kids, right? I have four of those. Well, they're not so little anymore, right? Hudson is like six, five, I think. It's like, hello, right? But when they're little and you get into a crowded room or you get to a place where it's a little bit scary, they kind of reach over and they grab, depending on how tall they are, right? Sometimes they just grab the leg. And actually, uh, many times, like, you know, being at church, I'm talking with a couple and their little one, you know, not knowing that it's me, is like holding on to my leg, why? They're looking for safety, and then they look up, and they're terrified. I get that, right? But the idea is this child knows daddy is strong. Daddy is going to keep me safe, and so they reach up, and then they relax, and they trust. Do you run to God for safety? Is it a comfort to you that he is in control, or or is it actually terrifying to you? Do you you believe that he is in control? Or do you live in this fantasy world where you basically go, I'm in control, am I not? I'm in charge. Sounds good to me. Here, Here's what Tim Chester, and and I should have probably mentioned this earlier, but he wrote a book that has been super helpful to me personally. Um, It's called You Can Change, and the the four God is great, God is gracious, God is glorious, and God is good statements come out of this book. And, And he makes this statement. He says this, If you do not trust in God's sovereign control... You will always be tempted to take control yourself. Oh, how true that is. And you are likely to manipulate the situation for your desired outcome. 
Are you trying to be in control? Are you driving yourself mad trying to be in control? Let me ask you this. Right now, what are you worried about? What are you stressed about? What is it that as you're just kind of sitting right there on your couch, in your chair, in your bed, in your pajamas, watching this, what is it that worries you? Are you in your mind going, oh my goodness, this, I have so many things to do. Like, why does the day only have 24 hours? I need 26. I don't have time for this. I, I don't have time to engage with my family. I don't have time to engage with my kids. I don't have time to engage with friends. I don't have time to serve uh, with the church. I don't have time. I got to go. I got to go. Are you, are you worried about money, the economic situation? And I'm not saying you should never be concerned about that, right? If you've lost your job and you have a family to take care of and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent. I don't know how I'm going to buy food. Man, A, yes, that is something that is real. B, we would love to help. We would love to know about that and we would love to see if we can be of help to you. But if you are constantly, oh, how do I recession-proof my investments and how can I get more money and more money and more money, what you're saying is God ultimately isn't generous to you and you need to control money and finances and the economy. Is it maybe your spouse? You want to control how they behave and you just can't. Is it your kids? Up to a certain point, you can control them, right? And then, oh dear, now what? And that comes sooner uh, or later for all of us, right? God, aren't you concerned? Don't you love them? Why are you allowing them to make these decisions? Don't you love me? Don't you care about me? Maybe it's your reputation. You're worried about what people think about you. And so you're just constantly trying to figure out how can I make myself look accomplished, look like I have it together. You're curating your social media profile. It's like you're consistently and constantly and in every single moment of every day on edge as if you were in the job interview for your life crushes you? Is it your health? And you're obsessively eating or not eating, obsessively exercising, obsessively taking vitamins, going to the doctor right now, obsessively trying to safeguard yourself, hand washing and hand sanitizing, your hands are raw and cracked and falling off, right? Like, are you just panicked? Because you think that's something you can control. And you've forgotten that Jesus says not one of you, by any amount of anxiety, any amount of effort, any amount of work, any amount of worry, can add even an hour to the span of your life. Are you sitting there? And maybe, maybe what you're trying to control is God himself and you're doing it with religion, you're doing it with legalistic righteousness because you figure, if I can get to a place where God owes me, I can control him. And I can control the outcome. See, each one of these are areas that we're trying to control. And when we can't, we, we ultimately fall into one of two responses. One is despair. It starts out with disappointment, and then it quickly moves into sadness and depression and ultimately despair. The other is rage and, and everything that comes with it, and you, you see it constantly uh, in various situations, in relational situations, in uh, just on the freeway, I mean, pay attention to that, in the mall parking lot, 
on the sidewalk. It doesn't matter, right? And it starts out with annoyance, and the annoyance festers, and it turns into frustration, and frustration turns into anger, and anger is blown up in full-on rage. All because you couldn't control the thing you so desperately needed to control. See, and it's not just that you want to control it. When, when you can't or when you feel like it's out of control, what you do, you accuse God. You say, God, you're not good. God, you're not caring. God, you didn't pay attention. God, your plan is bad. God, your strategy is bad. God, you're not generous. Here's what I need us to do. I need us to repent. I need us to repent, not just from the behavior, right? Because like we very, very easily could become behaviorists. I just like, well, this is going to be great. I'm going to uh, stop worrying so much. I'm going to stop stressing so much. I'm going to stop being so controlling. I'm going to, no, 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 no. We don't want to just do sin management. I want you to change what you think about and what you believe about God. Do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that God is great and he, as a good and kind God, is in control? And all things are going to work out for his glory and for your ultimate good. Do you believe that? Do you need to remind yourself? Do you need to become a preacher of gospel truth to yourself? Do you need the friends, family, spouse, kids, community group members to become preachers of the gospel to you so that you could not only say, God, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I was angry. I'm sorry I was frustrated. I'm sorry I used inappropriate language. I'm sorry, whatever. No, no, not, no, not just I'm sorry. I did this, but I'm sorry I believe this lie about you. Because, see, every time you do this taking control, what you're saying is, God, you're not good. You're not great. You're not in control. I need to be in control. See, and so repentance needs to look different. It needs to look, I'm sorry that I did fill in the blank. Because what it says about you, what it implies about your character is, God, I'm, I'm so sorry that I'm greedy and that I'm so worried about my finances because what it implies is that you are not generous. God, I'm sorry that I'm trying to control all my circumstances because it implies that I am Lord and you are not. And you can fill this in in any which scenario. And see, here's where community is going to be important because sometimes we will be in this place and we won't even recognize what is it that we need to repent of. So confess your sin one to another. Why? Because those others are going to help you see what is the underlying lie that you're believing about God. And I'm looking forward to the summer. I'm looking forward to the series. Because I believe that these truths about God are going to set you free. They're going to set you free from sin. And they're going to increase the level of joyful worship that you are able to bring to our God, to our Savior, to our Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you uh, for this truth of who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for intervening in our self-destructive, sinful ways. And Holy Spirit, I pray that uh, during this series, not just this week, but over the next several weeks, you would come and you would convict us of lies we believe. You would replace those with truth. 
And I pray that the truth would set us free. It would set us free from sin. It would set us free from anger and rage, from depression and despair. And it would free us to worship you with full and glad hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for us to respond to this. And man, it's, it's a great message to respond to. If you have prepared the elements, bread and juice or wine, to celebrate communion, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. The bread represents the broken body of Jesus, broken in our place. The juice represents the shed blood of Jesus, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Cross and crown, I invite you, celebrate that right now, remembering and celebrating the cross of Christ and his victorious resurrection.